Ken, can you, is the, do you have it on? You don't have it on. You have a, top. All right, I'm taking over for Dan and I'm gonna be doing his presentation today. He's been having some issues with the microphone. So I'm gonna be presenting on evolving with the canvas. <laughs> so without further ado, I wanna, uh, well, not, not without further ado, I just wanna introduce Dan. Dan and I worked together for quite a number of years at Christie and Dan's an incredible person with a long history in the industry. Worked in the media server field for, I don't know, ever. Um, and yeah, has an incredible amount of, of wealth to share with you guys. So Dan, over to you. And Dan's from Quince Imaging, but That's I'm right. sure he's gonna tell you that anyway. So Dan. You can't see it. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Woo! Hey, everybody. So yeah, uh, this is called Evolving with the Canvas. I, uh, we've seen a lot of great talks about you know, kind of the tools and deep into what they can do, case study, how amazing things can look. We've seen amazing projection mapping out there on the streets. Um, and I kind of want to get into you know, what is this art form and, and get a little philosophical about it and, and what are we doing? What, what is all this stuff kind of evolving towards? Um, my plan here is I'm going to start off with Quince Imaging itself, my company, and what we do, what we do in the present, and a little bit of how we evolved to get there. Uh, then I'm going to back it up to my own background um, and my own evolution and how I got to here. Um, and then a little bit of not my work, not Quince's work, but other things that are happening out there in the world. And, uh, and again, to this point of, of where is the canvas evolving to? Um, my intention is to uh, not, not emphasize the, hey, how big this is or how cool, how many pixels, but really just kind of like the awkward parts, the parts where we didn't know where, what was going to happen, where, we, you know, I want you to open your mind, stay curious in all your careers and, and you know, know that the, the thing you were told to do is not always the thing you need to do. The thing that needs to be done is often what you have to just go into your own mind and like figure out and go your own direction. And that's really what I wanna leave you here with today is, is, is kind of chart your own course. Um, the alternative is you could be a uh, camera operator at a stadium that does the same exact thing day after day after day after day. I won't rag on that profession at all. We need all these people to do all these amazing things. But um, I guess what I'm saying is that there are kind of professions in our industry that are like, okay, that's your job. Do it. Punch a time card. Keep doing it. And then there's jobs where you just, you, nothing is certain at all. And you don't know how you're going to achieve this. And, and there's gradations everywhere in between. And it, it's kind of your should be your career goals to find where where in that you want to slot in. So uh, first about the canvas itself. Uh, this came up yesterday and that we've been throwing these terms around without a real proper primer of what are all these things, right? Uh, so and I was I wanted to make this like into a quiz show like, hey, you can tell me which this is, but we're not going to do that. I'm just going to go uh, one at a time here. Uh, augmented reality, extended reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, and of course, reality. Um, we, we, uh, we in live events are only doing these, augmented reality and extended reality. Uh, mixed reality and virtual reality are headset -y things. Uh, and here, I'll just go one at a time. Augmented reality basically means uh, some graphics are going on top of what is seen. Now that can't happen in like free space, right? There is no Obi-Wan Kenobi holograph technology yet. So that is always either onto your phone or onto a broadcast. Uh, we at Quince don't do any mobile phone stuff, but if, if, you're, uh, if you remember Pokemon Go, that's like a good example of augmented reality on the phone. It's, it's, you're using your camera's phone to see a thing. The processing is figuring out, oh, what should I put there? And then it puts a Pokemon character there or, or whatever, what have you. 
Um, so now in broadcast, how this works is uh, cameras are around a stadium, let's say, but could be you know any venue. Um, those cameras have on them a position sensor. It could be a tracking system called Stipe. It could be a couple other different ones. I'm trying to remember the one that's the longest track man or something. Uh, did you know back in the 90s did like the first goal lines that sort of thing but compute the main thing to know is the computer knows where the camera is and where it's pointing including like the lens distance and that sort of a thing um and then a fancy media server is going to take that position data take the files and content it has still and motion and then overlay those two together pass that out of the media server into the broadcast chain and it goes all the way to the folks at home, including camera switching, right? That's that's a thing. You can have augmented reality effect from different angles. Switching cameras, all the cameras have those sensors and, and that's how AR works. Um, extended reality is when there's graphics behind the person or the reality or the objects in question. Um, and of course you can you can have both, right? You could have we call it a front plate and a back plate. Uh, graphics could be on top of the extended reality. But the, the difference is you're not just bringing in fancy cameras and computers, but you have to have a, a set or at least a green screen. Um, what is typically been used as an LED surround, right? And this, this has really been growing gangbusters in the last couple of years. There's a big company called XR Stages kind of has the uh, biggest market share. Um, and uh, Four wall and LNG and and these other some of the other companies have their own uh, sets as well. So that's extended reality where graphics behind, maybe also graphics in front, um, and tie it all together with real time media server. Mixed reality, uh, that's that's headsets that you can see through, basically, right? So um, there is some of the same. Uh, technology going on in terms of position tracking where is this uh, piece of technology in space and then a computer is doing quick calculations to then overlay graphics um, this is an evolving thing it, it's not evolving as fast as I think some people thought it would but uh, Microsoft HoloLens is what's shown here there's also the uh, Magic Leap uh, headset and there's a few other startup -y ones that are kind of coming into the space but um, this has been the way this has been evolving is it seems like it's going to be like kind of pigeonholed into like job training like engineering uh i know jpl the makers of like satellites they they were the first adopter for hololens and they are able to get together and like you know stand in an empty room and go like oh yep we need another gasket there okay yep jim let's uh design this do that sort of thing so mixed reality is very cool has no use for live applications and, and it's and it's kind of like really because what we want to do is is have a collective experience right or, or if we're just sitting at home watching movies or, or doing vr then like that's not our industry that there's no need for us so it's kind of a it's kind of a fake out where like this is the way to have multiple people engage in an experience with the graphics not just looking at a tv but you can't do it unless you have the two thousand dollar headset on and you know when are you going to get that headset on like a thousand people at a time so kind of a, a kind of a fake out for ha having group experiences it's really for you know corporate applications at this point uh and then virtual reality i i, I cannot make fun of palm we're lucky enough it's and or vr in general uh you know <laughs> vr is even more isolated than mr it's mixed reality without the reality. Um, virtual reality at this point is just a way to like go and do something fun by yourself or meet up virtually with other avatars of foxes and fursuits and, and strange stuff. No, I, I'm, I'm going to say here, I actually let, I have a four-year-old and eight-year-old. Don't bust the furries. <laughs> I totally let these guys into VR chat and they, they, as long as I'm in the room and I have a, you know, the mute button on basically um uh, virtual reality is is fun there is lots of fun to be had but there is at this point like no significant crossover with live entertainment and uh virtual reality it's just its own thing so 
that's the tutorial. That, that's the, the glossary, if you will, of all these. Um, so now we'll go into Quince Imaging. Uh, yes, so this is my company, Quince Imaging. We're based in uh, the DC area um, and, uh, in, in, Virginia, in Northern Virginia, that is. Um, I'm remote, I, I live in Vermont. It's very nice there. I try to get down to the office once in a while. Uh, <laughs> try, really try. Uh, the, um, Quinn started out as a staging company, basically, um, and uh, uh, with, with heavy emphasis on, on projectors, kind of our, our ownership's background was uh, uh, doing uh, uh, underground bunkers and like situation rooms and that sort of a thing. So a lot of, we have a lot of genetics in the, in the science of projection and uh, how the eye perceives and all that good stuff. Um, but flash forward to around 2012, 2011, um, Quince started playing with software called Pandora's Box, which, by the way, was not on your slide, Michael. Yeah. Oof. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, it's <laughs> But right, I know, I know, I know. All right. Uh, it, it, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. This software has taken over my life, and it'll, it'll now take over this presentation. And so you're you're fine. Um, uh, but no, with Pandora's Box, it's basically software to do 3D mapping, compositing, um, and interactivity. So with that tool, uh, Quint started mapping uh, stadiums, basketball stadiums, and um, hockey. Uh, it started off, it was, it was the, the Atlanta Falcons, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the New Jersey Devils were the first ones that uh, Quince did. Um, and I... I've got a couple of clips, but you know, I, I could, I'm not going to play them all basically. Uh, so start with, so we started doing mapping and that was also, of course, not just sports stadiums, but uh, projection mapping on architecture for live events. Um, and, uh, and it just kind of became a tool in the toolbox to do big video uh, projection stitching, right? You can do a large canvas with a me media server um, interactivity. You can play games and have like infrared stuff track you and that sort of a thing. So we did a whole bunch of that stuff, um, and and I'm just kind of basically condensing, accelerating all this history to the point where we uh, started doing augmented reality um, in the last couple of years because you have the media servers. We have, we we build our own is is one bit of secret sauce because uh, for years there was only one way to get Pandora's Box 3D features, and it's to buy the physical computer, mm -hmm. right? And that you know takes a lot of money and a lot of shipping. Um, but we started building our own computers and, and using different uh, media servers that aren't hardware locked. Um, so once we had that technology and uh, we were able to get into augmented reality, do some cool tricks, um, and uh, the culmination of all of this has basically gotten us to uh, a few <clears throat> locations, uh, uh, Houston Texans, which is this one, uh, Carolina Panthers, uh, have now have a permanent system for augmented reality, so they can, you know, sell ad sell advertising in this kind of new format and and have it in their show ready to go. Uh, so we're not loading in, loading out these camera systems. Uh, it's it's permanently there. So that that in itself is is kind of like a slam dunk in that, uh, you know, events come and go, right? Events, you put them together, you take them apart, you forget them about them. But when you can have this technology permanently installed, um, it, it starts to become something that, that can be grown upon, right? Uh, artists can innovate and uh, new, you know, ideas can happen. And that, that's kind of the, the point that I'm, you know, teetering on here or, or, or looking ahead or, saying what's next after this. So um, I'll just go through a couple of these uh, in, in what we're looking at. Uh, this is a championship for uh, Riot World's uh, League of Legends. Uh, this was in Paris and um, I was a part of this in 2019. We uh, did this whole surround video on top and then this is uh, actually a hologram scrim all, a surround hologram scrim uh, around underneath that screen. Um, so that was pretty cool to do. Uh, 
kind of crazy precision that you have to get with um, the holograph effect and, and warping to it and that sort of a thing. Um, we've been doing a lot of esports uh, events and, um, and and championships, and it's it's kind of as as esports has has exploded. I don't know how much exposure any of you might have to it, but there's a lot of people out there playing video games and a lot playing video games professionally, and it's kind of insane the amount of money that is spent. Um, and and for Riot, they uh, they they kind of go all out and, and do a giant blitz for their uh, for their uh, championship. Uh, this was the Minnesota Vikings did a thing for Prince, uh, and we just mapped the uh, the football field there. That is with a white canvas. We did not magically get uh, astroturf to turn white. Um, uh, this is uh, the All Star Game uh, where we mapped. Uh, baseball field at a pretty oblique angle at Nationals Park. Um, and, you know, this is kind of my one, like, technology shot. Like, yes, there are projectors involved. You do have to do rigging. You do have to do power and, and all that stuff. I, you know, forgive me if I'm, I'm going to severely take that for granted. Um, uh, but that's kind of, uh, and actually, let me just play one video. Oh, forgot this slide. Uh, other teams. We did other teams. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of wonderful teams uh, that we have engaged with. Um, so in permanent installation, so like I said, we were basically a staging company that kind of evolved into an, an integration company. So uh, now we have project managers, system designers, um, folks that do nothing but sit down and figure out how can something go in permanently? How can we work with the general contractor and uh, um, you know, crank out CAD drawings and, and line drawings and that sort of a thing. Uh, th th these are things that in events you can sometimes get away with hand waving or, you know, maybe let's not figure all this out, that out. But then when, when you're integrating, you really have to go through all the steps. Um, this is an army base in Virginia, part of uh, kind of Arlington Cemetery has a, a base. And then this is called Kami Hall, where um, they do kind of indoor uh, ceremonies um, and uh, they the, they came to us with the task was to replace these three like old drop down screens with a giant LED wall. Uh, and so we did it, we built the LED wall. Um, my point of coming into the project was, what do you wanna do with it? <laughs> Sometimes somebody will buy something without fully thinking through, what do you wanna do with it? Uh, no, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah, after the fact, but kind of during the process of design and uh, installation, it became clear that like, they have a large canvas, they have PowerPoints, like, but they didn't know, like, I had to basically step in and bridge the gap of like, what do you want this thing to do? And with uh, Pandora's Box and its companion program, Widget Designer, we basically went step by step and loaded up a bunch of features. Okay, here's your backgrounds. Now here's your pips. You're gonna uh, use there's a Spider X80 in there to overlay live camera images. Um, and then in within that process, somebody who was not even like directly working for the venue, but for the Army Band, came in. And Army Band is the is the organization that basically pushes the space to its limits usually. So he was like. How about alpha video? Okay, all right, all right. We could do alpha video. I, I reconfigured the whole system just to be able to let them do like, you know, overlays at, this is, oh, sorry, 10,000 pixels wide. So a 10,000 pixel wide alpha layer where you could have like, you know, lower thirds of something coming in is, is, is now possible. Do they ever use it? No, but they can do it. Uh, so, so there's a lot of that, right? Like. Uh, it gets them through their days of and and, and presentations, um, but they can also do some cool tricks once in a while. Um, and my my COVID story for that is that we commissioned the store the system in March. Uh, it was set for yeah March like 17th. I was set to fly down there, and my sister in law who works in travel called me the day before and said, "Hey, <laughs> there's a thing. <laughs> Don't get on that plane. You might not make it home." And sure enough, everything shut down. There day. Uh, so uh, that's the Kami Hall story. Um, this is kind of a great pulling all together uh, 
um, piece of uh, projection mapping plus interactivity. Uh, this is the Washington Capitals have a permanent system for projection and for tracking and Dunkin Donuts engaged engaged us with basically an, an agency of theirs uh, uh, built this game in unity and we were able to uh, make it a part permanent part of their show um, so they they do this thing called Dunkin run where uh, two people put on uh, a helmet which has a ID like a infrared beacon on it basically and then they have a timer and they run around and get as many coffees as they can and it looks like this ah it's mushy and getting artifacted oh that's 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 just really terrible I, you know i think it worked better in preview actually yeah there we go So the donuts are following them is the main thing. And then as they get the coffee cup, they get a point. And if the chomper donut gets them, they lose their points. You know, for untrained performers being given interactive technology, I'd like to think it works well enough. Kind of skip ahead. Hooray. Oh, there's a tie. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that one was a tie. So what do, you, what, do you, what do you do then? Who do you give the gift card? I don't know. Um, I'm going to mention virtual productions, though it's not that much of a big thing that we do now. But in, um, oh boy, it's going back to this interview. Uh, we basically, uh, when COVID hit, we turned our studio into a virtual production studio. We did the NFL draft that year, that April, um, where I don't know if you would have seen this, but Roger Goodell was in his own basement. He had a TV screen behind him that had 15 fans of each team that uh, that was being, uh, you know, getting their draft picks. And uh, and my buddy Eric Cazillo, our director of innovation, his job was to get the fans to scream on cue. The problem is they just never stopped screaming, so we couldn't. <laughs> um, but that, uh, that's a segue actually into our other uh, form of production here. Uh, Virtual Seat was this um, product we developed uh, to get fans into, um, uh, into the broadcast via their own webcam. Um, so it's basically, you know, it's a fancy web server that's running somewhere in California. Uh, that has just super fast links to people's own, you know, single megabit connections and then can bring them in and arrange them in the media server uh, to be part of the show. Um, I don't have a slide for it handy, but we did the uh, WWE Thunderdome. I don't know if anybody saw that, but that was real LED screens in an empty arena, in an otherwise empty arena, uh, where wrestling was happening and we, you could see... Uh, yeah, you could see people watching from home and they could see the show. I really should have brought an image of that because it's pretty cool. Um, and then augmented reality, uh, like the same slide as before, this was, uh, I think, the NFL's 100 year anniversary. We did a thing with, you know, graphics hanging in space. Um, and here's the other augmented, let's see if this one works well. So this is with multiple cameras, which is really great to see that, you know, the tracking is pretty good. All this, this virtual track that does not exist in the real world can be perceived to be really there. I'm sorry? Hooray. Sorry, what's that, Michael? Uh, Unreal. Yeah, right, right, right. So yeah, Unreal for pretty much everything we do 3D um, and Unity for game stuff, interactive stuff. Um, you know, this, this, which is kind of like where I want to kind of like hover and poise and pause here because like, wow, that's nifty, but it's a Kroger ad. 
right? Like there's so much more that could be done with this. It's not even a real contest. This is a fake contest, but you could have like, you know, I don't know, people standing up the bleachers and if they stand at the right time, it measures you and yeah. So th there's, there's a lot of that. I, I lose sleep wondering like, how could this be something more than it is? But, but on, on, on the other hand, like, hey, you know, we made some money and, and people, people were uh, into it. I got to do this back and forth again. Um, uh, oh, yeah. And look, there's the slide with just a giant Unreal logo because, yeah, my point here is uh, it's all going to Unreal. Uh, I, I would even say that Unreal will not disappear in 10 years. I think that the, the level and scale to which Unreal has taken over is, is significant um, in that, uh, uh, you know, media server selection, we, we don't use as much Pandora's box anymore, if, if any. Um, we've evolved to others. We, 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 uh, there's Ventus, there's Pixera. We... Um, but uh, Unreal integration is, is, is really important to have Unreal as the core graphics thing that's taking in the content. And then media servers have an important role in that they are giving us controls uh, that aren't just like tick -tick 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 Unreal you know, assets, but you need real-time control. You need integration from lighting desks and audio systems and that sort of a thing. So that, that's what the media server itself is. Um, so that's my segue to my own journey, um, which I am going to, I'm going to like probably just literally go to the, my portfolio website cause it's faster than, <laughs> than PowerPoint. But, um, I started out in theater. Um, I think in this crowd, it's important to say it was university of Maryland theater department that really got my, my, my chops, uh, going, uh, all the faculty there were working designers in Washington, D.C. I got to, you know, apprentice for a couple shows. Uh, working while in school was amazing. Um, so, and they built the uh, Clary Smith Performing Arts Center my junior year, and that was really amazing because, uh, you know, the theater before was kind of getting a little threadbare, and, and it was great to, like, learn old technology, like Lico brand Lico's, and, uh, your three pin this and that, um, and then go into this amazing new performing arts space where I've got you know, giant strand consoles and Vera lights and, and projectors and stuff, but then go out to the work in the real world and guess what, it's Lico's and threadbare wires and stuff like that. So very important to learn, you know, it's good to learn both sides, high tech and low tech. Um, so from there, uh, my first real job basically was the Washington Opera uh, down at the Kennedy Center in DC. And that was where, uh, and, and that I, I could go on about. It was an amazing adventure to be, you know, barely 22 years old, but um, in charge of a crew of IATSE people unpacking a, a freight container full of somebody else's opera. And I just had to rapid fire say like, that goes line set 22. That one goes, oh, I think upstage. Uh, just put that one aside. And I just had a clipboard and radio and, and, uh, and fight the good fight. I, it was kind of, Kind of a pretty cool job. From there, uh, in 2007, uh, we, the lighting department at the Washington Opera bought a system called Coolux. Coolux Pandora's box. And that was my, like, what is that? Uh, and I met uh, Sam Kremmelmeyer. Some of you in the room may know. Uh, he's been basically the, the United States uh, Coolux Pandora's box head tech guy uh, for, for as long and still today is still on the road doing stuff. Um, he and I hit it off. He said, hey, come out to California and do training sometime. Um, I took a little loop through grad school first. I moved to Brooklyn with my girlfriend at the time, now wife with two children. Um, we And I started a, a broadcast program in Brooklyn College. Uh, and And it was that spring when I realized like, Man, they don't. There's not really much going on with this program. I realized the second year of the MFA is they just hand you a camera and say go shoot a documentary. So I, I was kind of wandering around a bit, and I, I, uh, I, I found myself at NAB uh, in in uh, 2008, and uh, and I ran into the Coolux booth, 
again. And there was there were uh, my friends that I had just met, uh, and and that got me thinking. And I went to flew out and did the training on Pandora's box, and um, and uh, then I had a bunch of training, but not yet any paid work to do it with. So that's a thing you can you can learn more than you can. Uh, it is possible to learn more than is economically useful to you. Uh, so there I was living in New York doing lighting gigs still, but like, hey, I, I can do some video. Can you really need the video? Um, we're, uh, Sharf Weisberg at the time was becoming world stage and they uh, were buying a bunch of Pandora's box and I was able to do a couple gigs for them. So that was great. Um, I also was a, a uh, a independent salesperson at the time. I basically uh, was given a demo kit by Coolex International, two projectors and, a, and two media servers I had in kind of Pelican cases. And uh, I, I, I can't say I was up to the assignment at the time. I was not a very good salesman, but I did go to a couple like nightclubs and stuff. I was like, hey, let's try this. Can you do that? How much does it cost? Uh, so <laughs> it, it, that didn't, all I can say is that didn't go anywhere. Uh, Twists and turns. At uh, 2012, I um, got an offer to work for Coolux International, the uh, California US branch of, of Coolux, basically. Uh, also, DBA uh, Theatrical Concepts, which is uh, still in operation. Um, so then I was working full time for Coolux and taking support calls from some weird company called Quince Imaging. Like, what are these guys doing? That's a funny name for a company. Uh, so yeah, that was my first engagement with Quince Imaging was being support for them as they were mapping the Cavaliers and doing this and that. They were calling and saying, how do we get this tracking working? When I warp, it doesn't you know, do this, do that. Um, so, you know, having that knowledge of the software basically uh, had me in that role as supporting other companies doing doing installations and sometimes flying out to uh, to help them to integrate it and whatnot. So that was that was kind of that's so that's Pandora's box chapter one and chapter two as a struggling freelancer and then as a full time person. Um, and I am going to bring up uh, I'm going to talk about a couple projects uh, uh, starting with Vegas Viva Vision. Okay, and this oh, who who had this in their deck? You, Mark, uh, yep, John did. Yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Vegas Viva Vision, giant LED screen. It's uh, a quarter mile long, actually. And, um, and it, they came to Coolox basically with the assignment of replace the computer that's doing this. We need a new system. It was, I don't know, there's not even a brand name for it. Somebody kept calling, you know, like calling it the Korean machine or this weird machine from Korea that apparently the, the, the pic, it, you wouldn't think that this is only 1024 pixels tall um, and and it was always putting out like 1023 <laughs> so there were problems with the machine we put in Pandora's box media players um, and I just want to kind of a little anecdote of um, uh, so I show up you know it's I'm, I'm gonna be in Vegas for a week by myself uh, working with uh, George George Johnson Mammoth Productions was uh, was our client there and uh, I kind of, you know, start my first day, we physically install the things, plug things up, but there was a lot of programming to do because we had to integrate this into their like timing and scheduling, turn the lights off, that sort of a thing. And it was just kind of this like pile of things to figure out. And after the first day, you know, it's like, okay, five o'clock, all right, see you, George, I guess I'll go get dinner and wander around. But like, the gears were still turning, like, how would I do this? How would I do that? And and it was like after dinner, I'd probably had a, you know, a, a slush, alcoholic slushy of some kind uh, <laughs> as I wander Fremont Street, um, not, getting, not getting into too much trouble. And, and uh, I ended up texting George and, and he was still there. And I was like, all right, well, why don't I just go back and keep working on it? Now, I don't want to advocate like unnecessary overnight work in, in, in any regard, but it was kind of a transition moment where I realized like, oh, this this is just kind of up to me. It's my problem to figure out. So I'm not getting in anybody's way if I just go figure it out. And, and that was pretty cool. That kind of got me through a lot of mental blocks of like how to do this and that with Widget Designer. Um, and I, th I think it was kind of a, a, a moment uh, after 
feeling like for many years that like, oh, there's just no time to figure out everything. And oh, there's so much software to learn. And oh, how will I ever? And it's just kind of an early moment of like, make, just make the time, you know, just do, do what you want. If a problem is yours to solve, then solve it however you want um, is the lesson there. Uh, this was a, just make it work. Yeah, or make it work. Uh, this was a very random installation at the Salesforce Tower in, uh, in San Francisco, where uh, the idea was to have a wraparound uh, cameras at the top of the building and then a uh, and this uh, <laughs> view master basically where you can look around all of San Francisco. Um, I'm not sure if they kept the system there. I'm not sure if it you know did everything they wanted to do, but that was just you know very random thing. Uh, Harvard Business School, a uh, big screen with uh, lots of controlled stuff. Uh, this is in San Diego. Um, and one other, what did I want to, oh, uh, Met Gala. This was a 200 foot wide, uh, this is with hypnotizers, okay? I have, I have used hypnotizers. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this was, uh, the Met Costume Gala is their big like fashion party basically in New York. And uh, uh, the, the assignment was to uh, fill this 200 foot wide wall in the Temple, Temple of Dender with this content. And my fun bit on this one was that like, you know, tensions are high. Everybody's so like, oh gosh, it's got to work. It's got to be great. All the people in dresses are going to come in. And who's in charge? But it's Anna Wintour, right, of Elle magazine, the, the protagonist or antagonist of Devil Wears Prada. Um, so like we're, we're got the thing technically set up. We'd spent all night, you know, warping and everything. And, and it comes down to like content approval. And, and everybody just kind of scatters like, okay, yeah, the content just needs to get approved. And, and so, you know, so it's going to get approved by Anna Wintour. So I realized like, okay, I, it's time to like take a laptop and walk over to her and say, what do you think? And like, you know, bracing for whatever that might be. And she just, she watches it on the laptop and, and, and smiles and says, what do you think? And I say, uh, I think it's cool. She's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> so it's just kind of a fun moment. Um, uh, First Baptist Dallas, uh, the cool thing about this gig is that they built a um, scale model. So compound curve screen in the main sanctuary, right? It curves out and in and out. It was uh, seven Barco 20K projectors, rear projecting. Um, but then they built a scale, working scale model of that screen in the control model with 7K projectors. Uh, and, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. It was two Pandora's box systems basically working in parallel to, to throw the same sources in the same places. And uh, I've just never seen anything like it. I think it was a great idea to solve, like, you know, how do we really know what, what, the, what the sanctuary is, look, is looking like? So. Um, and, and then the last one I'll pull up uh, just because, uh, oh no, two more, I'm sorry. This is an interactive media wall. This is for uh, the cable industry's lobbying group called NCTA. This is where all your Comcast money goes basically to convince senators that cable has a great impact on the economy. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the star of this show is widget designer in that um, similar to Comedy Hall, we showed up to install computers and they said, okay, what does it do? So we had to like completely sit down and go from scratch, like, well, what do you want it to do? And we, you know, got them to figure out like, okay, we have videos to play, we have images. Well, how are we going to bring it up? And we just started from scratch making this like gesture language uh, with a, this is called an air scan uh, device up top. It's basically a LIDAR device. And uh, thanks to Widget Designer, this kind of all of, Swiss Army uh, program, um, we were able to just uh, build in like all this behavior, like what happens when you swipe, what happens when you go full screen um, in just two weeks. So that was pretty cool. Um, it is no longer in, in place. This was 10 years ago after all. Uh, but yeah, that's an example of interactivity with Pandora's Box and Widget Designer. Um, and then the last one I'll point out, uh, Da, 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 
oh, don't log in the Squarespace, um, is, uh, uh, did I close my own thing? I think I closed my own thing. <laughs> <laughs> too many tabs, too many tabs. Uh, uh, this is one that, uh, th this is definitely a moment of like, nobody had, nobody had the instructions, so I made them myself. Um, uh, Christy was coming out with uh, the Barco 4K40. Uh, no, Christy was coming out with the Christy 4K40. Sorry, oh my God. There's a lot going on here. Um, and uh, it, for LDI, LDI, uh, the trade show was going to be the debut of that. And um, uh, But there was no projection mapping planned. It was kind of like the, there was a marketing department. They had all the details on the booths that they were going to install, but like no projection mapping. So um, I kind of got the approval of some higher ups to like just design something and build it. And I, I made a little model. I made a little sketches. I showed up, I bought some fabric from Rose brand. I showed up in Vegas. I went, I got a, I rented a car. I rented some tools and an air compressor and got some lumber. I built these flats, projection mapped it, and put this all together on a credit card, right? Like <laughs> they didn't give me a budget. They just said, oh yeah, we should probably do that, Dan. So, so I did it, right? Like, and this is you know, how it ended up. I think it was, it was pretty nifty. Um, projection mapping didn't go as, as nuanced as I wanted to kind of in the rush, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's a thing that happened. <laughs> <laughs> just to allay any ideas that like, just because a company makes the best projectors in the world means they have their S together. But that's, it is not. It is not true. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's. Um, I I I think I got through everything that I was uh, going to say about myself. Uh, uh, from Christy, uh, <clears throat> I after Christy, I uh, kind of took a summer learning all the other media servers. That was my like final. Finally, like. You know, get out of my single single pigeonhole cave um, and learn disguise, learn Pixera, learn uh, Ventus actually through Quince. Uh, my presenter view, um, and uh, oh, this was supposed to be back in two thousand seven. This is this is Gwen Stefani. I did not work on this show, but this was basically when Coolux came to America with the Gwen Stefani Harajuku Lovers Tour or girl, whatever it's called. Uh, these projections are, are reasonably bright and they're actually at 70 degrees off axis, shoot firing down from above. Um, so that was something that only could be done with Pandora's box at the time. And that was its kind of big break. Um, that was a, a Kulux project. Um, so I told you about this one time in Vegas. I told you about Bible Money Place. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you could call it a church if you want, but uh, the, the, pa the, the pastor, oh, I keep doing that. Uh, the pastor, you know, was targeted by ISIS, not for the nice things he said, but for other things he said. Um, uh, this is where I want to say, okay, so that's, that's things Quince has done, that's things I have done. Where are we going? And what's, and what's next? And what, how is this canvas evolving to? And uh, and so this is not me or Quince, but I just want to point out this this entity called Illuminarium is now doing immersive cinema in two locations and growing. Uh, they're in Atlanta, they're in Vegas, and this is like all the pixels, right? This is. Where is all the pixels? Where's the North Carolina theater right now? Ah, <laughs> It's multi, it, the fact that PowerPoint takes over your second display, even if you have it in, whatchamacallit, uh, is killing me. I gotta hit, not hit the escape key. Thank you, okay. Luminarium is a immersive cinema uh, experience. Um, it's basically, they've created kind of the largest canvas to date of uh, just pixels and, and what can you do with that? And they have gone and forth and made these uh, original shows, all with their original content, that's in contrast to the Van Gogh and you know painterly experiences where they've basically taken 
public domain art and made a show out of that, which is all fine and good and definitely entertaining. But this is kind of, so this is the next level of investment. You have to make so much content for each of these shows that you have to justify a $50 ticket. Uh, and, and so this is like, everything's getting more, right? There's more space to fill. There's more people to, to see it in a space. Um, and you need more content. You need more producers. You need more money. Um, so we, we, I haven't been to a luminarium yet. I don't know if anybody in the room here has. Um, but this is kind of like setting the bar for like what, what is all this pixel technology and real-time technology headed towards. Because beyond that is something called the sphere, which is not open yet. Uh, it is definitely visibly under construction in Vegas. I think last time I was there, it was like a hulking iron <laughs> ball <laughs> that uh, you know is becoming more and more like this. Uh, uh, you can call it the Death Star. It's fine because um, this. this is an ev evolution beyond a luminarium. It's it's going to be inside and outside, fully, um, fully. Uh, oh, oh, that's a great shot. So it's basically it, the inside is half seating and half uh, interior uh, LED. That's the size of the canvas, and uh, it'll be a touring venue basically for uh, artists to come in and make an experience. How much content is that? Too much, right? Like this is this is beyond, you know, just a little cube where you're showing some safari and space stuff. This is like even bigger and all eyes are on the technologists behind this operation. <laughs> <laughs> to see if it's going to work. <laughs> no, I uh uh <laughs> uh, uh, Je Jeffrey's uh, getting himself a, a beverage because, um, yeah, no, it's it's seven cents. Uh, media servers, uh, I believe, are are being selected to drive this experience, and um, uh, you know, you, you've got integrators in there figuring out how all the networking is going to work, the audio system. It's just this is a giant new piece of technology that we I'm rooting for it right like we want to see this thing turn on and kind of change our industry in some uh, mm -hmm. in some way now I want to scale back a little bit and show something like way more low-key lo-fi and chill but also very kind of futury and w could we be going this direction this is called dynamic land and it's really just a set of experiments um, I don't think they're even open anymore in, in um, uh, Oakland uh, but Brett Victor is a is a UI UX guy. Like kind of, he did early Apple websites and has a bunch of those chops. Um, and Brett Victor kind of ha has this talk in 2014 called uh, the Humane Representation of Thought. And he basically says like, we're not really using all our senses, right? You know, we we even even to categorize senses, we're locked into this. Oh, there are five senses, but like, what about Aesthetics. What about you know space memory and, and, and all this stuff? So he's basically making an argument for ambient computing, and that um, you know that, that that we shouldn't be so device focused and, and locked into our our displays, but that that computation and even collaboration could happen in space without uh, you know going to a tablet or 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 turning something on, turning something off. That. So this is this is just kind of a reel of of experiments that they're doing. It's uh, you know camera tracking looks at the color dots and figures out what you're trying to do, and they make little robots and toys and things move around. So zero practical application at this point, right? Uh, but but I just want to show you this this one example of how you know immersive technology and tracking technology could be for kids and and you know anybody, not just experienced uh, technologists, and that uh, we could evolve somehow someday into the space where we're, we're not just putting up giant screens, but we're, we're doing more like, you know, it's kind of an always on thing where you walk into a room and, 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 and uh, manipulate your, your ambient devices. So that's a thing, ambient computing, it's really not around yet, but I'm, I'm rooting for it. Um, 
so that's kind of my, my, my global look ahead. And now I will shift back to the Quince look ahead of uh, uh, this one project we're working on in Charlotte called the Carolina Theater. And um, <clears throat> what this is, is a gut renovation of a 1920s film venue, film house, um, which was, you know, had its, had its heyday in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and then was shut down in the 60s and just sat kind of defunct through the 70s and 80s. And then, um, uh, I don't want to say in 2010, 2015, uh, the city came together. Foundation for Carolinas is is, is the is our client and the, and the force behind it. Uh, took took ownership and took charge of this renovation. What we are doing, what Quince is doing in this space, is all the audio, all the video, all the lighting, all the networking, all the technology, uh, including projection mapping the interior. So this is where you know, I'm. Like I said, it's it's great when projection mapping can be not just an event, but uh, but a permanent installation. This is kind of like the boss level for us, right? We we are going to install projectors to uh, map uh, the uh, the restored murals that they have there, um, the trim and everything, the proscenium. There'll be a film screen that comes down. We'll map either you know on the big red drape or on a screen. Um, and then, you know, turn it over to them, let them do weddings and rentals and that sort of thing. We're not going to be there, you know, being like, oh, look at the big Quince imaging stuff. It's, it's for them. It's really for the theater and for the community uh, to kind of bring some new ideas and uh, new uh, experiences and a new way to sit in a, in a proscenium theater. Um, so that's, that's kind of what keeps me going. And, and it's, a, it's a really exciting project. Um, and uh, uh, it, it involves a lot of, uh, so yeah, this is what it looks like now, or at least a couple months ago. So it really is a, like from the bones, from scratch, everything from get the plaster to, you know, to the paint and, and all the wiring and everything. The project itself has had many delays, right? Like a hundred year old building that you dig here, you find something that's not supposed to be there. So then you have to go other routes and that sort of thing. So we're in all these, you know, weekly subcontractor meetings. And uh, um, I, I kind of do account management for this project. I'm not in the lowest nuts and bolts, but thankfully we have project managers and system designers that are cranking out all the line drawings, all the CAD, all the spreadsheets. Oh my God, keep me away from spreadsheets, please. Um, but no, you know, really we have, you know, a spreadsheet with every single device that we are bringing into the building. Um, Barbizon is our subcontractor for the lighting. Thankfully, it's a lot of experience in Barbizon. They come in and, um, and are doing all the theatrical lighting itself. Um, so it's a lot on our plate, but it's, um, I think, a very worthwhile project. And uh, just some random shots of, of the Carolina Theater. Um, and oh, you know what? OK, so I <laughs> totally forgot a little tidbit I was going to throw in uh, back in 2008. Kind of at the start of my video career, uh, I went to a uh, LDI symposium in New York. Uh, I got to see Josh Weisberg explain all the types of DVI. I didn't even know that at that point, and that was wonderful. And then a, a, and a scenic designer named Eileen, I want to say Callahan, um, she stood up and said, please, somebody invent a silent projector, <laughs> right? Because that's what Broadway video designers are up against. You cannot put an image on stage without either an LED wall or a hot, noisy machine on the balcony rail. And that is just like a severe design limitation. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, so that, that's a tidbit. But, but um, the, the, uh, the conclusion of that story is that for this project, we are uh, in the process of, of uh, designing in uh, remote head projectors from digital projection. They're very new, they're very expensive, but they will basically hang down inside the space just below the ceiling and be totally quiet and not need cooling except for the like, you know, giant ballast that's at the end of an optical cable far away. So, <laughs> um, so that is kind of how, that's, that's our special sauce in this operation. That's how we're gonna be able to map this, this uh, impressive space 
without uh, giant hulking hot projectors. Um, and um, honestly, it took the construction delays to to push delay this long enough for DP to get these things in the market. Like this is, I, I will not say it was like the magic of Quince. We brought them special tool. Like, no, it just took that long to get this thing show ready. Uh, the, the projectors, I think they've only had applications in Europe. This is one of the first applications in the United States. And so we're, we're happy to use those and happy to, to make a new canvas. Um, that's it. Uh, I think, um, yeah, I, like I said, I, I, I want you guys to kind of just keep your minds open and, and see how things could zig, zig when they could have zag. And, uh, and yeah, I'll take any questions. <laughs> this has been, it's been kind of like therapy for me. I gotta be honest. Like, uh, just to make sense of, you know, I don't think I even like 14 years of only using Pandora's box. It was not as, it looked more fun than it was. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, questions, please. Say. That's a lie, Dan. <laughs> it was fun. You're right. Oh, but oh, I do want to make one point. Uh, uh, Kirsten had a great slide of all, all kind of all the risks and things you run into of, of getting deep in a project. And one of them was transferability. And, and, and almost on the spot, I coined a term, and it is the, the untransferability singularity. It is possible to program something so complex that you will never get someone's attention enough to tell you them how to do that so they can take it off your plate. Don't get yourself into an anti-transferability singularity. It's not fun. Um, I've had projects that have kind of followed me through my uh, freelancing days and into my present day, and they still call me up and say how to do this, how to do that, and I, I it's that's it's not great. So try try not to do that. Try to do pair programming. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Try to get a buddy when you're programming the nitty gritty and that sort of thing. Okay, now I'll really take questions. <laughs> yeah, John. The Carolina project. How like can you tell us a little bit more about that project? Just like the resolution. Right, so they're 4K UHD, 69, uh, and the uh, brightness is uh, in 10K chunks with a laser module, so you can basically get up to three for a 30K, yeah, right. brightness. Seven of them. Six of them, Six, yep. Yeah. So it's kind of like landscape, portrait, landscape, landscape, portrait, landscape, yep, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're gonna do a 10 them uh, uh, a couple months from now and, and actually see the things on, on the real surface. And that'll be, yeah, pretty gratifying to see yeah. what they can do. Are they using it like a cooling system externally? Yeah, so they're basically in the rafters where there's, you know, close enough to the HVAC yeah. there uh, that we don't need to pump extra stuff through them. They can kind of blow hot air into the return. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Else. I think they're hungry. They're hungry. They're hungry. Yes, that's right. I am standing in the way of lunch. I should not do that. Uh, no, you so. still got time. You're not. You're still definitely on time. Yes. Anybody else have any questions? No. Thank you, Dan. Cool.